2021. And I give the call to the member for Wills in continuation, who I'm sure will be pleased that I interrupted him to do the previous <laughs> matter. <laughs> the thank member you, for Wills. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. As always, uh, very much on the ball with the importance of that motion just ahead of uh, the continuance, continuance of our debate on this bill. Um, Deputy Speaker, there are a lot of reasons why offshore wind must be harnessed for the good of our country. In the long run, there is potential not just to generate electricity for us, for us here in Australia, but also to export that energy into other countries. There is potential for export to Southeast Asia. The rest of the world is already taking advantage. Boris Johnson, Prime Minister, UK Prime Minister, has pledged that by 2030 wind farms could power every home in the UK. Well, imagine that for Australia. One, one of the already proposed offshore wind farm projects in Victoria is the Star of the South off the Gippsland coast. If built, it would have the potential to supply up to 20 per cent of the state's energy, or around 1.2 million homes. Um, and that's 1.2 million homes that will get their heating, their washing machines powered, their microwaves uh, with the energy for their microwaves guilt-free from the gushes that blow around our state. And I can tell you what, Deputy Speaker, it is very windy around there in Gippsland. So what I find amazing, Deputy Speaker, is that one turn of a wind turbine provides as much energy as a solar panel out in the sun for one day. One turn. They're big turbines. And these turbines turn 15 times a minute. And if you multiply the amount of turbines in the installation, it gives you an idea of the scale. But the other story of offshore wind is the jobs that it creates. It is labour intensive. You have the construction phase, the maintenance, and because they are offshore, the workers can't swim there. Maybe some of us can, but, but certainly it's not practical. They have to be taken by a crew. So this creates maritime jobs and port jobs. Estimates suggest the offshore wind industry could create as much as 8,000 jobs each year from 2030. And these jobs will be created in areas that are going through economic change and transition, like the Hunter Valley, Gippsland, La Trobe, Illawarra and in central Queensland. 26,000 people already work in the offshore wind industry in the United Kingdom. Another 70,000 are coming uh, on board by 2026. In Australia, Green Energy Partners have two projects they are looking to start exploratory, exploratory work on off the Illawarra and off Newcastle. They want to use Port Kembla as a construction hub. The government likes to talk about technology, not taxes. But here we see them, late to the game yet again, always late, always laggards, when it comes to offshore wind technology. Now, there are some issues with the bill that we don't feel are adequately addressed. The Senate committee examining the bill, including the government senators who lead the committee, made some suggestions that it considered important to the legislation. These include one, amending the, uh, the objects clause to better incorporate electricity transmission and exports, an amendment on the consultation requirements for declared areas, and the government should consider amendments to the changes in control provisions. These three suggestions were made by government as well as non-government senators on the relevant committee. It's surprising then that the minister has so far decided not to listen to his own colleagues. It's becoming a pattern, Deputy Speaker, where even government members of various committees make recommendations or a, um, a part in supporting those recommendations. The minister ignores them. We are also concerned over the bill's work health and safety framework. The committee heard substantial evidence that the government has not adopted the harmonised national WHS laws in the bills. Instead, the committee heard that the government has amended those laws into an unrecognisable state. Without a harmonisation of these WHS frameworks, we may end up with a situation where a worker would be subject to one regulatory regime onshore, a second while in transit on a vessel, and a third while working on the offshore renewable project. That poses confusion and risks for both workers and employers. Another concern we have is that the bill does not require local benefits to be included in merit criteria for licences. When the Minister of the Day is considering whether to grant an offshore electricity licence, he or she should be required to consider benefits for local workers, businesses, communities and First Nations people. Currently, the bill as it stands does not do this. We would welcome an amendment to ensure benefits for local communities where these new industries will be situated. But despite these concerns, I am shocked to see that the government's change of attitude 
has occurred on wind farms. Once upon a time, they were too noisy, unappealing to look at. That was the, the narrative that they were pushing. And they've flip-flopped all over the place on this. It's only taken them eight years to finally make a decision uh, on climate change policy. And after all the melodrama we've seen over the last couple of days, the infighting, the scare tactics, the huffing and puffing in the Nationals' party room, all that hot air in the national Well, I, I could feel it when I walked past in the corridor. It was so, so much hot air coming out of there. And then they rocked up with a reheated policy announcement from last year. Talking points that the Prime Minister delivered just reheated from last year's so-called technology roadmap. And he whacked it on a PowerPoint and he thought, by doing that, oh, I can call it a plan. And I think he mentioned plan about 94 times in his speech. This, this so-called plan, Deputy Speaker, is as hollow as the Prime Minister. It shows a lack of conviction and the so-called plan is as shambolic as the Deputy Prime Minister, who is flip-flopping all over the place, wanting to be both the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia and a rebel against the government, a rebel with a cause against his own government. Talk about schizophrenia. Talk about not knowing who you are. Because, Deputy Speaker, ultimately this government acts in their self-interest when it comes to climate change uh, policy. Interrupt the member for a moment, the minister. Look, just, just in relation to that last comment, he, he did link the Deputy Prime Minister and then he used a word which I don't think that could reflect on him. I just want to ask him to withdraw that. Yeah, I'll just ask the member to withdraw that particular reference. I withdraw, Deputy I, Speaker. I thank the member, and the member has the call. I withdraw, Deputy Speaker. And the point, though, I'm making, the substantive point, is that this government has a good track record in maintaining their self interest above all else, the interest in maintaining their power. That's it. They're not using that political power that they have in the executive to implement policies in the interest of the Australian people. They're not doing it in the interest of Australia or even in the, to the rest of the world when it comes to what is clearly a global problem uh, in reducing emissions. That's probably why it's taken so long to get even a whisper out of them or even a policy uh, or semblance of a policy out of them. And even then, it's a zero plan when it comes to net zero emissions. Unlike that mob over there, Deputy Speaker, unlike the government, on this side of the House, we do believe, we do have conviction in a set of policies that will make a difference. Because it's the right thing for Australian jobs, it's the right thing for our climate and our environment, and for future generations. We're committed to climate policy for those reasons. It's not about us. It's about the future generations. It's about what is important for Australians today and into the future. And it's not because it's politically expedient either. These are hard decisions that have to be made. And for all the talk and criticism of Labor on the opposition benches, we are still in opposition. But we are a party that can form government. We're an alternative government to the Australian people. And we have policies that will take on climate action on climate change real substantive action on climate change. And it's about Australia being brought back into the community of nations who will fight the good fight on this global issue. So unlike the Liberal Party, the Nationalist Party, whose policies are not really based on scientific evidence but a lot of hot air, we base our assessments, our analysis, our policy work on the science. That's why we're committed to net zero emissions by 2050. That's why we committed years ago. That's why we will have more ambitious targets. And if we're elected, we will invest in electric cars to make them cheaper. Critically important transition. In 10,000 new energy apprenticeship jobs, because it is about jobs and the opportunities that come with renewable energy. We will invest in hundreds of community batteries to power hundreds of thousands of households around this country. And we've already announced, the leader has already announced, $20 billion to rewire, rebuild and modernise the electricity grid for the renewable energy age. That is the future we are investing in and committing to. As I said, Deputy Speaker, it's about future generations. It's about what's important for Australians. And, it, and for Australians, it's about us making us a, an energy superpower, a renewable energy superpower. We have the assets. We have the resources. We are blessed with an abundance of natural resources, and we're not taking those opportunities. That's a failure. And offshore wind is part of that future, part of that investment. 
in new jobs, in new industries driving our economy, of a reliable, affordable, clean energy future for our children and our grandchildren. Only the Labor Party, when it forms government, will make this happen for Australians and for our future generations. Thank you. I thank the member. Um, the Leader of the Opposition, I thank the member for um, 